Golden State Media Concepts bring you Book Review Podcast, a haven for bookworms of all ages and the widest genres from mystery to memoirs, romance to comedy, fantasy to sci-fi. If you love to read, this is the podcast for you. It's the Golden State Media Concepts Book Review Podcast. Welcome to the GSMC Book Review Podcast, brought to you by the GSMC Podcast Network. I am your host, Sarah, and it's Tuesday. I don't always know what day it is, but I know today is Tuesday. I I double-checked to make sure that I would get this podcast out on the right day. Yeah, how are you doing? How are you doing in isolation? Um, Anybody else feel like it's slowly sucking their brain cells out? (laughs) I feel really stupid some days. Like the simplest tasks take monumental effort to figure out. Things that I've done a million times, suddenly I've forgotten how to do. Um, I know I'm not the only one, but uh, share your stories with me. Let's commiserate. I would love to hear how, well, I'd love to hear how you're doing anyway, but uh, tell me tell me how it's affecting you. Hopefully you are taking care of yourself physically, um, mentally, emotionally, spiritually, all of those ways so that you are staying healthy um, in, in all possible ways during this time. And one thing we can do during this time is read and listen to podcasts. So, hey, here is a podcast about books. Seems perfect, right? Today, I do have an interview for you. Today, I'm speaking with author Alan Orloff about his new thriller called I Know Where You Sleep. Even the name sounds chilling, right? I mean, nobody wants to hear I Know Where You Sleep. I just picture it or, or um, hear it in my head in a, a really creepy voice. You know, I Know Where You Sleep. Uh, well, yeah. Um Yeah, uh, yeah I don't want to hear that. Um, let me go ahead and give you the description of the book. When Anderson West takes on the pro bono case of Jessica Smith, a 20-something restaurant hostess being stalked, the last thing he expects is for his investigation to spiral into breaking and entering, assault, and legal threats from the suspects and the victim. But that's what happens when you run a private investigation firm with your rule-breaking loose cannon and sister at your side. While Anderson spends his time deducing and interviewing possible suspects, Carrie handles interrogations in her own unique and personal fashion. And it seems like everyone is a suspect. There are Jessica's ex-boyfriend and current boyfriend, her incredibly creepy boss, and the suspicious reverend at her church who definitely seems to be hiding something or someone. The closer Anderson and Carrie get to an answer, the more danger Jessica finds herself in. Her stalker's notes become increasingly more threatening, trading the scary phone calls and text messages for terrifying photographs and notes at her gym, work, and home. To make things even more complicated, Jessica's backstory begins to unravel, and the secrets of her past could potentially solve everything, if only she'd let Anderson and Carrie in. With time ticking down, will the brother and sister investigative team be able to solve Jessica's case before she tries something foolhardy, like place, like facing up to the tenacious, oh, tenacious bastard on her own, armed only with a handgun and a prayer? Uh, I apologize. I don't usually use language on the podcast. Um, that's not too bad of a one, but took me by surprise. That is the description of, uh, I Know Where You Sleep by Alan Orloff. It is a thriller. We talked a little bit in the interview about the fact that it is more uh more suspense than you know how I, I I don't like the gory or the really 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 like violently scary. Um, Alan says he doesn't that this is not one of those books with a, an HBC a high body count. I I got a new acronym from this interview. So yay, learning new things forgetting things too, but learning new things here in isolation. So I always appreciate that. This is uh, definitely a page turner. If you like this sort of story with just suspense and the unknown, uh, you know, mystery, obviously, because uh, Anderson and Carrie are trying to figure it out, what's going on, who is it, figure it out before it escalates even further than it does. 
And it also has, this book also has really great dynamics between Anderson and Carrie, um, between Anderson's children and his mother. Uh, his mother lives with him and his two children. So there's some great family dynamics in there as well, in addition to the story. In fact, it would be great, I think, if this uh, had a series, because I think there are some characters in here that I would really enjoy watching how they develop and where they go and how their relationships evolve throughout the the course of a potential series. So let's go ahead now and turn to the interview with Alan. Again, the book is called I Know Where You Sleep. Hi, Alan. Welcome to the podcast. Hi, Sarah. Thanks so much for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. I am very happy to have you here to talk about your book, I Know Where You Sleep. Before we get to the book, though, if you could share a bit about yourself, uh, that would be great. Sure. Well, I've been writing fiction for maybe 15 years, and um, I write both novels and short stories. I Know Where You Sleep is my ninth published novel, and... um, you know, I just keep keep working away, keep writing and, and publishing and trying to stay, keep my head above water. Sounds good. So um, give a bit of an overview of I Know Where You Sleep, which, I mean, even the title, you can tell it's going to sound, it, it sounds ominous. So it's <laughs> going to be creepy, right? right? And, yeah. and if, you, if you see the cover, you'll know it's going to be creepy. Um, exactly. You know, I wrote that... Uh, what inspired me to write it really was um, I've always been a big reader and I started reading in, in high school. I didn't read the classics, uh, you know, all the stuff that was assigned in our English in English uh, class. I didn't really get, I didn't understand it. And I didn't, it had no interest to me. So I would read a lot of science fiction and then I moved on to horror. And I read a lot of that into my, you know, into my twenties and I was working in Boston and I had a, a boss who said, you know, Alan, do you like to read? And I said, sure. Well, have you read a series about a uh, detective, a private eye in Boston? And it was, it was the guy's name is Spencer. And I said, you know, I'll give it a try. So I, I read the first Spencer book and then I would just, I, I mean, I loved it so much. I just devoured it. So I've always had sort of that love for the Spencer type of private eye book. And uh, I finally, on my ninth, ninth book, I finally had the opportunity to write a a private eye novel. So I was very excited about that. Um, The book itself really is about a brother and sister team. And the brother is the sort of the lead private eye. And he owns a a firm, private eye firm. And he's sort of taken in his sister because no one else will give his sister a job. And she works in the office. Uh, She's not a full-fledged private eye, but she kind of thinks she is. Uh, And, She's got a bleeding heart, and she's got her own uh, set of issues, you might say, some anger management issues, uh, to be specific. Uh, So in this particular novel, uh, a a poor young woman is being stalked, and she comes into their firm wanting help in in solving a problem. So that's sort of what kicks off the action, and throughout, Anderson, uh, the guy, and Carrie, his sister, have to sort of uh, attempt to find out who the stalker is and find a way to stop him or her. Yeah. And of course there's, it's never as simple as it seems. There's always hidden secrets in books like this. And of course I won't go into them because we want people to read the book. Thank you. Let's, (laughs) <laughs> Let's talk a little bit more about Anderson and Carrie. They're very, very different. They're siblings, but they're very different. Um, what about each of them do you think might resonate with readers? Uh, okay, sure. Uh, Anderson is more of your uh, prototypical private eye. You know, he's, he's a, a tough guy. Um, he's not. A, I wouldn't say he's exactly a rule follower, but he tries to keep his antics in check. He's concerned uh, on the firm's behalf of not losing their license, of playing, you know, not breaking any laws, uh, at least none that they can be caught for. Um, and sort of he believes that hard work and diligence will get the job done. You know, if he follows his private eye uh, instruction manual, he will he, he will find the culprit. Now, Carrie, on the other hand, as you, as you alluded to, is exactly the opposite. She never met a rule that she didn't want to break. 
Um, so where, you know, if you consider Anderson to be more of the ego, perhaps, Carrie is pure id all the way. And, you know, as a writer, writing her, her parts was so much more fun than writing it from Anderson's point of view. So I had a lot of fun with just sort of letting it all hang out and, you know, what's the kind of the craziest, worst thing uh, someone might do in her position in, in had it, you know, getting a chance to write it that way. So that was kind of fun. Yeah, you spend a lot of the book going, oh, man, what is she going to do now? <laughs> and it's right? really yeah. a good yeah. I think Carrie, in a lot of ways, is one of those characters that makes you feel a little better about yourself because she makes such odd, seemingly crazy decisions. And you're like, well, at least I'm not doing that. Uh, she's she's very interesting. And um, I don't know if she's exactly likable, but she keeps you engaged for sure. So we're going to go ahead and take our first break of the podcast. And when we come back, we'll be talking more about the voice of the book. It's written in both first and third person. So stay tuned. You're listening to the GSMC Book Review Podcast, and I will be right back. Are you tired of the same old news? Are you sick of the seemingly endless political spin and negativity? The GSMC America Still Beautiful podcast is a weekly news podcast covering all the top positive and uplifting news stories. We cover stories that will inspire, uplift, and remind you of the good in the world. Tune into the Golden State Media Concepts America Still Beautiful podcast to get all the great and positive news stories of today. Download the GSMC America Still Beautiful podcast on iTunes. Stitcher, SoundCloud, Google Play, or anywhere you find podcasts. Just type GSMC in the search bar. Welcome back to the GSMC Book Review Podcast. Before the break, Alan was speaking about Anderson and Carrie, the uh, siblings involved in the private investigative work in this book. And we're going to talk a little bit more about why he chose to write them in different voices. Um, In terms of their voice, you write Anderson in the first person and uh, Carrie in the third. So what prompted that decision to write in the different in the different voices yeah well i think that writing a first person kind of brings the reader much closer to the character you know get that sense of intimacy which i was really going for and and sort of the first person uh, point of view style is um maybe i don't know if it's typical of a private eye novel but it's very common in a private eye novel but i again i'd also wanted to show things from carrie's perspective and I figured, I mean, a lot of books do it, have more than one uh, first-person narrator. But when I read books like that, I get really confused. So I wanted to have a little distance between the reader and Carrie. Maybe I didn't want the readers to get too into, into Carrie's head for, for what might happen to them. But um, I thought it would be interesting to sort of, you know, have the, the main narrative in first-person from Anderson's point of view and sort of a secondary uh, Carrie in, in third-person. I hope I pulled it off okay. I think I did. Yeah, absolutely. Um, And I agree. Often when there's more than one character speaking in the first person, if it's not done well, it can be hard to figure out as you start each chapter who's who's speaking. Um, So their relationship is complicated. Uh, They're siblings. They work together. They are vastly different personalities. Uh, How does that relationship help to um, fuel the story or progress the story? Um, yeah, well, I mean, they were raised from the same family, and I do show some of them. What, another thing I enjoyed writing was sort of the family dynamics. Um, Anderson is, is widowed, and he's got two, two young children, and um, his mother, and I had a few scenes where uh, those four are, the, are in the scene, along with Carrie, and sort of the different uh, ways that they sort of approach uh, just family dynamics. I thought that was interesting too. But uh, both Carrie and Anderson have the same goal. They very much want to help help this poor woman uh, who's being stalked and solve a case. So part of the fun I hope for the reader is to see how two people 
with the same goal, use very different means to achieve it. Um, so again, you know, Anderson was more of the uh, doing the things in the routine and sort of the typical way one might solve a case where Carrie is more of the out of the box thinker. She, you know, she's willing to take a lot more risks than uh, Anderson was. So I, I hope the, the counterpoint between the two um, proved to be interesting as well as uh, you know, Anderson, not only does Anderson have to worry about uh, solving a case, he has to worry about keeping Carrie in check before she says, does something that, that would either be rash or something that would be, um, uh, that, that would hurt their chances to solve the case. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that. Um, how much research did you do for the book? Uh, well, typically, I'm not a big research guy, so you're not going to find me writing those big, uh, thick historical mysteries because there's just too much research. I never liked history in school. It just really wasn't my thing. I'm more in the, of what's going on in the present or the future. You know, science fiction is pretty interesting to me. Um, but I do want to make sure that my books are accurate and believable. I, I'm really striving to get that verisimilitude. So I do whatever research it takes for me to kind of understand things. So in this case, I did a fair amount of research tr trying to understand stalking, um, you know, what the characteristics of a stalker might be and the kinds of feelings that, uh, you, know, uh, you know, I hate to use the word typical, but um, a stalking victim might have. Uh, and, you know, I, I mean, nothing in this book is really autobiographical. I mean, I've never been stalked, thank goodness. But once I did have an, a situation where someone made me uncomfortable with some unwanted attention. And I think most people, you know, certainly most women have probably experienced something like this. But I have to tell you, it was pretty darn unsettling. And, you know, in, in my writer's imagination, I sort of maybe started there and say, well, what happened? What would have happened if you know, this had, had happened and then if that had happened and if I had responded this way and this other person had responded that way, what, how, you know, how far down the line could we have gotten with this, uh, with this? So, I mean, I sympathize for, for anyone who's gotten, you know, unwanted attention or been stalked. I mean, it's, it's terrifying. Uh, absolutely. Yes. I'm grateful that I have never been to that extreme as well. But uh, like you said, I've had experiences that have left me unsettled. And right. um, yeah. yeah, I think I think even if people have not been full on stock, they're going to be able to relate to the, the character, Jessica, who is the one that they are trying to help, who is being stalked in right. this story. Yeah. Um, and I think most people have, have to some extent come across someone who has, you know, you know, sent their uh, hackles up, you know, something that, that uh, they got some weird vibes from. And just mm -hmm. imagine, you know, if you dial that up, you know, 10 or 100 times, what it might be like to have, you know, a true honest to goodness stalker after you. My goodness. Right. right. And the book does escalate. I mean, the things, it starts out with just phone calls and then it moves on from there. And again, I don't want to give things away, but um, it, it does escalate. And so you know that it's not just, I don't want to say, that the calls were not that threatening, but you know it it, it escalates to to more um, personal, more frightening, um, more immediate dangers uh, throughout the book. So you have that building tension, um, right. which and, is and, always good and, in a thriller. And, exactly, and unfortunately, that's a fairly common pattern for stalking. Which again, you know, during my research, I sort of found that out that. Uh, you know, things can escalate very quickly and um, very, uh, unfortunately, very uh, violently. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So what is it about writing thrillers that appeals to you? Um, you know, I love reading thrillers. I love to have my, my uh, heart pounding and try to, you know, just turn those pages as fast as I can to see what happens, see if my the heroes are going to be able to uh, you know, solve situation. Um, and really, it's that simple for me. I like to write stories that have people turning the pages as, fa as fast as they can. I, it's, you know, once in a while, I'll, I'll get a communication from a reader and say, you know, darn you, Alan, I, I you know, I, I stayed up to 3 a.m. because I had to finish your book or uh, stuff like that. So if I hear uh, something like that, that's sort of the ultimate compliment that people have put aside 
uh, what they're doing, their regular routine, and they, you know, had to keep reading my book. That's kind of what I'm, the goal I'm trying to achieve. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the the um, staying. Do you, do you get the do you get the the? I stayed up until three a.m. because I couldn't sleep because of your book comments. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I haven't. I get, no, it's mostly you know I had to finish reading. <laughs> but the other thing would be just just as much of a compliment to me. Yes. Yeah. yeah. People tell me they've had bad they had bad dreams or like you know stuff like that. Yeah. And this is definitely um, uh, more toward the suspense side of thrillers. Um, there there are some incidences that uh, display uh, violence, but um, it's, it's not it's not uh, terribly graphic or or violent in more of um I don't know what I'm trying to say. Um, it's definitely on the yeah, suspense there's not a high body, side there's not of a high body count. Right? Yes. Thank you. Sometimes sometimes um, writers talk about the HPC, the high body count. Yeah. yeah. It's not, it's not like um, so it's definitely going to um, give you nightmares or keep you awake from the suspense, from the oh my gosh, what's next, rather than from just overt violence or or the high body count, which it, or yeah, the type I of thrillers I I prefer. Um, <laughs> I'm I'm not great with a lot of a lot of blood, so thank you. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're welcome. I am getting braver about the thrillers that I read, but I'm still kind of a wimp when it comes to this type of book. Let's go ahead and take our next break. When we come back, we'll be talking about whether or not Anderson and Carey will be making a repeat performance in another book. So stay tuned. You're listening to the GSMC Book Review Podcast, and I'll be right back. Tired of searching the vast jungle of podcasts? Now listen close and hear this out. There's a podcast network that covers just about everything that you've been searching. Hey! The Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network is here. Nothing less than a podcast bliss with endless hours of podcast coverage. From news, sports, music, fashion, cooking, entertainment, fantasy, football, and so much more. So stop lurking around and go straight out to the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network. Guaranteed to fill that podcast podcast itch, whatever it may be, visit us at www.gsmcpodcast.com. Follow us on Facebook and Twitter and download us on iTunes, SoundCloud, and Google Play. Welcome back to the GSMC Book Review Podcast. Before the break, I was once again confessing my yuck factor to when it comes to thrillers, but I am growing. I am learning to appreciate thrillers more than I ever did before. Let's go ahead and get back to the interview with Alan Orloff. On the cover, this is listed as a PI thriller, and you did talk a little bit about uh, wanting to write a private investigator novel. Will there be others with Anderson and Carrie or will there be others with other PIs what are your thoughts on writing more thrillers in this in this genre yeah um i would love to write another anderson uh, west thriller that would be a pi novel thriller that that would be great um but you know publishing sort of a very odd duck as a business and a lot depends on if the publisher would want to see another in the series but um, yeah, and I had I had a lot of fun writing it, and, and like you said, you know, it's my first real opportunity to write uh, a private eye novel or series, and um, you know, I've already got an idea for the next book kind of mapped out. I've written the first chapter, um, so we'll see where it goes. I mean, no, there's nothing contracted at the moment, but um, you know, you never know. So yeah, hopefully. And as far as uh, other PIs, you know, I I probably write another Anderson West novel before I introduce more uh, private eye characters. Yeah, probably. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, I, I definitely think there's room to uh, not only have more stories, but also to see how uh, Carrie and Anderson grow as characters throughout a series. Yes. Um, you know, that's the, I've heard that comment a lot. They're like, 
wow, it'd be great to see what happens with Carrie next. Yeah. Um, I, for some reason, I mean, I, maybe it's not uncommon that um, a secondary character, because sometimes you can write them a little more um, vividly, if that makes sense. They, you know, they're on screen. They're on on screen. They're on, uh, you know, at the forefront a little bit less typically, so you can have them do wilder things. Like you couldn't have a book of just the main character just doing crazy wild things the entire book. That would be kind of goofy, I think. But sometimes a secondary character can stand out more. Um, and I think it's definitely the case with Kara. She has a much stronger personality, let's put that way, I think, mm-hmm. than, than Anderson does. Um, one of my early readers suggested that I just write a book all of, all from Carrie's point of view and forget Anderson, just have her go. Oh my. Go crazy. So <laughs> that'd be, that'd be intense, I think, but. I think it would be. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, are there any of your other books that you would like to highlight or mention at this point? I'm um, sure. Yeah. Thanks for the opportunity. Um, you mentioned sort of a different kind of thriller. So my previous novel, um, I think you would classify more of a high concept thriller with a much higher body count and it had a much um, more of a, a save the world kind of premise whereas I think you correctly identified um, I know where you sleep is more of a suspense or, you know the, the stakes are I mean they're while they're very high for Jessica the victim you know for society at large they're probably not that great but in Pray for the Innocent uh, it, the stakes are very high so I, let me just give you the sort of the premise um, in the shadow of the Pentagon, so this takes place in, in D.C., uh, there was a, a secret uh, DOD, Department of Defense, uh, experiment on brain research that has gone terribly wrong. So um, one a, a special ops trained soldier escapes from the lab, believing he is a Russian terrorist, straight from the pages of a 1980s um, spy novel. And he's on the loose, and the feds have to t- figure out how to catch this guy. And they have, they turn to the only person they can, and that's the uh, the author of the book who wrote in the 1980s, who's now a, a retired English professor who's a recluse who wants nothing to do with this. So while there's a, a sort of it kicks off with sort of um, a science fiction twist at the beginning, uh, I thought that was a pretty cool premise for uh, a novel. And it was fortunate enough to win the last year's um, thriller award for best ebook original. So, uh, and I got the idea. You'll, you'll, may, you may appreciate this. I got the idea for that novel, the premise. I woke up with it at 4 a.m. and it was practically fully formed in my head, which has never happened since. In fact, when I wake up and I don't have an idea like that, I'm a little bit disappointed every morning. <laughs> But right. um, it was crazy. It was crazy. I've never had – it's never happened before in the past, and I'm guessing it won't happen again, but it was nuts. Anyway. Did you write it so down was, uh, immediately, or did you remember it? Yeah. No, I I wrote it down, and, and, and I remember I, the next morning – the next this was on a Sunday morning. So the next day, I called my agent and said, you're not going to believe this. I woke up with this amazing premise of this idea for this for this novel. Um, well, what should I do? And she's like, okay, well, put aside the novel. I was working on a novel at the time. I was about halfway done. Put aside the one you're working on and just write this one. So I did, and, and um, you know, it came out pretty much close to my vision. And, um, yeah, it, got, uh, it came out pretty good. So I was pleased yeah, with that. Yeah, and, and, and it got an award, and so it must have been a really good 4 a.m. dream you had that, that you yeah. then woke up and – yeah. Yeah. That's really yeah, cool. Pray, pray that happens again. Uh, and I also have a couple <laughs> of, um, you know, while I'm talking about books, that I got a couple of stories in anthologies, anthologies that just came out this spring. Both pretty cool projects. One was is called The Swamp Killers. And in it, there were 14 or 15 of us that sort of tell a novel in stories. So each of us tells a story and they're sort of loosely connected to tell a larger narrative arc. Uh, and this sort of is a follow-up of um, an anthology that's pretty much the same group of writers did two years ago called The Night of the Flood. And um, so that's kind of an interesting project to see, uh, have is one that... story told. Yes? Yeah, oh, I was just going to say, uh, did Ed Amar work on that? Yes, yes. 
Okay. Yeah. yeah I I, okay. He's he, one I, of the co-editors. Okay. Yeah. He he was on the podcast a while ago, and I I remember him talking about uh, the the night of the flood. So that's really cool. Yeah. Yeah. It was very cool. Both. I mean, both. They're not your typical anthology. Let's put it that way. Um, you get different voices and different tones and styles, kind of telling the same story. So it's really it's pretty cool. And then another very interesting project that I'm involved with is uh, an anthology where all of the stories are inspired by Joni Mitchell songs. And that's called The Beat of Black Wings, which is the, the title of one of her songs. And that just came out, uh, I don't know, three or four weeks ago. And I'm really honored to be included because the, the roster of writers is just a who's who of who's writing great short fiction in the mystery community. So if you're a Joni Mitchell fan, um, it's at least cool to see sort of the interpretations or sort of the jumping off points where different writers, uh, you know, the, the avenues they took to sort of um, based on her story, based on her songs to come up with the inspiration for their story. So that was kind of cool. Uh, two follow-up questions on that. Uh, first, what Joni Mitchell song did you write about? Well, I picked my, I mean, I'm a, I'm a pretty big Joni Mitchell fan. Uh, I picked mine based on the title. Most of the other writers picked it on the song, whether they like the song or the lyrics, whatever. I chose mine almost exclusively on the title because I, my, the, the song I picked was Sex Kills. And I thought that would provide me with uh, many opportunities to, to come up with a great story. So, um, mm -hmm. yeah, so that was pretty cool. And then my second question is, how on earth did somebody, I mean, <laughs> that's really fascinating. Somebody is just listening to Joni Mitchell and they think I should get a bunch of writers to write stories based on her songs. How did that come about? Do you know? Um, well, you know, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty good friends with the, the editor, Josh Pachter. And he has a story where he had come up with a, a, a short story with the, the, um, with the character's name was Killer Kyle which is a, a Joni Mitchell song from, a, uh, from one of her songs, a lyric from one of her songs. And he tried to place it, and he couldn't really. And then at the same time, he sort of noticed that there were other anthologies based on artists' music. Like there's a Bruce Springsteen anthology, and there's a Steely Dan anthology, and a, a Go-Go's anthology. And he thought, you know what? Why not Joni Mitchell? So that's sort of where the idea was born. and. Um, yeah, I've read a few of the stories so far, and they are just terrific. So I'm looking forward to reading the rest of them. Yeah, and uh, well, I, again, what just, was the name just, of that one? It's called The Beat of Black Wings. And let me okay, add that one-third of the, the proceeds are going to be donated to the Brain Aneurysm Found, Fond Foundation, uh, the Brain Aneurysm, whatever. The, the uh, I, think it's, I think it's Foundation. Um, Joni Mitchell had a, a brain aneurysm a couple of years ago, a few years ago, which she's recovered from. Um, so we thought that would be nice to donate some uh, money to that. Yeah, absolutely. That's great. I always love hearing where people come up with ideas for things like anthologies or really ideas for anything. I'm just fascinated when they have an idea and then they execute that idea and it works and it's great. I, I feel like I have ideas, but they just swirl around in my brain. I'm sure I've done something with an idea once or twice, maybe. I'll think about that. I'll get back to you. Let's go ahead and take another break. When we come back, we'll be wrapping up this episode and uh, talking about Alan's alter ego. So, well, his pen name at any rate. Stay tuned. You're listening to the GSMC Book Review Podcast, and I'll be right back. Pets bring such joy to our lives, and the GSMC Pets Podcast is here to share in that joy. We'll tell stories of pets finding their forever homes, acting in unexpected ways, being helpful, or just being silly. Whether you love dogs, cats, llamas, reptiles, fish, or you've never met an animal you didn't like, the GSMC Pets Podcast is for you.
Welcome back to the GSMC Book Review Podcast and my interview with author Alan Orloff. You also write as Zach Allen, so can you talk a little bit about that writing? Um, are, are there differences in the writing style, the genre, etc., from what you write as yourself, as Alan? <laughs> yes, as, as the real me. Um, yeah, you know, that sort of came about. I had written... Uh, I guess three stories, my first three stories were with um, a publisher called Midnight Inc. And they were fairly traditional, not too violent. Um, you know, they didn't have high, bo- high body counts. It wasn't, there wasn't any gore on the page, really. Um, mysteries. And I had, I had, at the time, I'd come up with this idea for, you know, all my agents hate me because I don't write in one genre. I sort of bounce around a little bit. Which makes it a little different, difficult to find an audience and build an audience. But at this time, I had come up with this great, what I thought was a great idea that involved cannibals. And so I wrote this novel. It's, it's a horror novel. And I'm sort of writing it, writing it, and just coming up with crazy, gory, disgusting things that made sense for this book. And I'm realizing that the people that really enjoyed say my first book, Diamonds for the Dead, which was an Agatha Award nominee, um, so a traditional mystery. They probably may not be the same people who would like this cannibal book, which was called The Taste. And I wanted to have some way to sort of signal to to those loyal readers that this might be a little different. I didn't want um, you know, a, a lover of gentle mysteries to pick up the taste thinking, oh, look, another Alan Orloff book. Let's give it a read. And then for them to get, you know, 20 pages in and like, you know, and be really oh my angry. God. Yes, yeah. exactly. Now, hopefully it's obvious from the cover and the title and the book description on the back what kind of book it is. But I didn't want to take anybody to take any chances. So that was sort of where the Zach Allen originated. And then I had a couple other books that were um, also a little gorier probably than my typical. So I thought, well, I might as well put those up as, uh, you know, publish those as Zach Allen. At some point, I may go back to my backlist and just make them all Alan Orloffs. I haven't decided. Yeah, but there probably won't be any more Zach Allens coming out, unless I think of another mm-hmm. horror novel, and then maybe. Yeah. <laughs> you just never know. That <laughs> might be your next 4 a.m. Right. revelation. Exactly. Exactly. Yes. Um, what are you working on right now? What am I working on now? Well, I've got a book that's finished, that's making the rounds. Uh, you know, editors are reading at different publishers. And that's, um, you know, it's another, I, I would classify that as a suspense novel. And I'm in the middle of trying to revise uh, another book that's about sort of a family of con artists. And, you know, I, I wrote I wrote pretty much a, an entire first draft, and I sort of realized things just didn't come together the way I wanted. So I'm, now I'm in the process of going back and trying to revise and move things around and rejigger everything. So that's kind of what I'm, what I'm into now. And I'm still, you know, write, writing the occasional short story if I find something that's um, interesting. One, one, I just sold a short story to Alfred Hitchcock's mystery magazine called Gator Palooza, which uh, I'm not sure when that's going to be published. Hopefully within the next year. So I've got a lot of things going on. Yeah, yeah you do. Um so when did you start writing? Um, is it something that you've always wanted to do? Have you always written or um, did you start writing later in life? How did that work for you? Yeah, well, I mentioned that I didn't like reading some of those classics in high school English. Well, I should have said that I didn't like high school English, period, much to the consternation of my father, who was an ex-English teacher in high school. Um, I was always a numbers guy. So I went to uh, University of Maryland as an undergrad, and I studied engineering. So I never had to take an English class. I never had to write creatively whatsoever. Um, I did engineering for a little bit. I didn't really like engineering, so I went back to business school 
in which case I did never had to take an English class, never had to do any creative writing. Um, so throughout most of my career, I never had to do any uh, creative writing. I never had the I never took a creative writing class. I didn't know anything from anything. So maybe 20 years ago, 15 or 20 years ago, I uh, sort of looked to my wife and I said, I think I want to write. And then I had to I had to bend over and pick her up because she had fainted, and I revived her. And she's like, okay, well, whatever. So being the engineer <laughs> that I was. I wrote a few proof of concept short stories, and they weren't horrible, so that kept me going. I took an adult ed class at the local high school, well, you know, an introduction to creative writing or something. And as part of that, I had to write a short story, and it didn't stink. And the instructor was complimentary. She said, "You know what? This is not so terrible. This has some promise. You know, the first thing you do is need to get rid of all the semicolons that you use, but otherwise, you know, had some." potential. So I kept at it and I took more workshops and I joined up with some critique groups and kept working on my craft and, you know, kept writing, writing novels and manuscripts and submitting them and trying to get agents and so on. Sort of the typical way that uh, a beginning writer tries to break into the business. And, uh, you know, I just kept, kept, kept at it. I didn't give up and, and um, you know, I got an agent and I sold a book and, and so on. So, no, it's not something I always wanted to do, something that came to me rather later in life. Um, I've, sort of, I've always been a, a big reader, though, and I think that's what sort of propelled me uh, forward. Yeah. And in terms of reading, then, uh, you mentioned you didn't like the classics in high school. Uh, you preferred horror or thriller. Uh, is that does that tend to be your go-to genre now, or do you have um, favorite genres or authors that you like to read for yourself? Uh, yeah, yeah. Well, most of what, I mean, honestly, most of what I read is uh, in the mystery, thriller, crime fiction genre. You know, I have a lot of friends that I've met at these at these conferences and conventions and at various other events, so I like to read their, read their work and support them. So I read a lot of of my friends' books and so on. I'm not going to mention them because I'm sure I would leave somebody out. Uh, I do like to read, you know, I read Stephen King. Uh, I like to read horror when I get a chance. Uh, once in a while, I like to read science fiction. So it's sort of the same, and I've been reading those all my life. Uh, once in a while, I like to read uh, some young adult fiction, too, you know, coming of age story, something like that. But, you know, I don't read a whole lot of nonfiction. And I don't, like I said, I don't read a whole lot of historical stuff. Although, the as I get older, what I think is, you know, things things that are historical changes, right? I, I, there's a great series. Um, I will mention James Ziskins writes a great series, the Ellie Ellie Stone mysteries, that's set in the 1960s, and in mm -hmm. some category classifications, that's a historical mystery, right? But you know. I don't want to date myself. That doesn't seem like so historical to me. Right, right. It's not right, like right, Regency right. or you know, something like that. Right. Someone, someone was saying that they wrote a historical uh, short story that took place in the 80s. I'm like, what? The 1980s? <laughs> I know. I think in the 1880s. No, but he was talking in the 1980s. I'm like, wow. Just yeah. Yeah. Uh, the, it's the same with music right. when you hear songs that you grew up with on the classic radio station right. and you classic think, what? Yeah, like, yeah. Right, exactly. exactly. Yeah. yeah. Jumping back in here so we can take our final break of the podcast. When we come back, Alan will be giving us some advice if, in case you are an aspiring author. Stay tuned. You're listening to the GSMC Book Review Podcast, and I'll be right back. The GSMC Life and Happiness Podcast takes you on a journey of exploration. We'll discuss tried and true methods alongside the latest trends of how to best live your life to its fullest and happiest. From psychology to meditation, science to self-help books, the GSMC Life and Happiness Podcast will help you to discover what makes you happy and how you can live life being the best you possible. Download the GSMC Life and Happiness Podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, Google Play, or anywhere where you find podcasts. Just type GSMC in the search bar.
Welcome back to the GSMC Book Review Podcast and the conclusion of my interview with author Alan Orloff. Okay, good. Um, do you have advice for aspiring authors from your own experience? Oh, yeah, sure. So I mentioned I took these workshops. There's a, there was a, there's a great facility, a great resource in Bethesda, Maryland called the Writer Center. So I, I took some, some workshops there, you know, 10, 12 years ago. And 10 or 12 years later, I have gone back to uh, be an instructor for workshops. So it sort of went full circle. And I've noticed uh, certain things that uh, many of my students, uh, they'd have, they'd come into roadblocks. And one of the biggest pieces of advice I can give to someone who's, who wants to write a novel, for instance, is to finish, to get to be able to write the two words, the end. I've, you know, had encountered so many writers who, you know, they want to write a novel. So they'll write a first chapter and they'll, they'll go back and they'll revise it and they'll revise it and they'll hone it and they'll tweak it and they'll spend weeks and weeks and months trying to get that first chapter just right thinking or believing that they need to have a good foundation to really build their story on. So they work on that first chapter. So then they'll move on to the second chapter and they'll uh, spend a lot of time uh, writing it and revising it and polishing it and tweaking it and so on. And then they'll look and they'll say, you know what, this chapter is really good, but there's some, the, what I've written has made me want to change some things in the first chapter. So they'll go back to the first chapter and they'll tweak it and tweak it and tweak it. And then they go to the third chapter and so on and so on. And they never get to the end. And what I found is by getting to the end, then you've laid your entire story out. And more often than not, once you've written your entire story, it's different than what you had planned your entire story to be when you were first starting out. So, for instance, those first two chapters that you spent maybe five months polishing and revising and so on, that might, not even be, that might not even be where your story starts. Your story might start in chapter three, or it might take an entirely different turn, in which case you have to totally revise chapters one and two anyway. So, and again, this does not work for everyone. You know, I'm the first person to say, hey, if you're doing something and it's working, stick with it. Don't listen to advice from somebody else who's not in your shoes, who's not at your seat on your, with fingers on your keyboard, right? You need to do what works for you. But I think there's so much value in getting to the end and, and knowing that you have the uh, wherewithal to write an 80,000 word or 50,000 word or 120,000 word uh, story that somewhat makes sense. And we all know that uh, good books aren't written, they are rewritten. So no matter how great your first draft is going to be, odds are that you're going to have to go back and revise it significantly for it to um, match your vision that, that you have for the book. So that would probably be my biggest, my biggest um, advice is to get to the end. And in order to get to the end, some people need, um, you know, some sort of routine. So whether it's a daily quota by word count or, you know, a time, you know, I write two hours every Saturday or whatever it is, you know, as long as you're making forward progress and you can get to the end, I think you're in much better shape. Than the Thank you for that. I know you have a website, uh, so if you could tell people uh, where they can find your website and where they might be able to interact with you on social media. Sure. Website is at alanorloff.com, and I try to keep it updated fairly frequently now that on virtually every single appearance and, and uh, convention and conference has been canceled for this year, sadly, uh, I probably have to go back and revise my events page. Uh, but you can kind of keep up with what's going on uh, there, and there's links to my books and, and so on. The anthology, I think, are all up there, and they will be shortly. And you can find I'm pretty active on Facebook. And it's um, Alan Orloff. You know, and maybe it's hmm, maybe it's Alan S. Orloff. Anyway, it's it's the one that's the writer and. Don't think you need to be a friend of mine to be, a, you know, friendly on Facebook. Most of what I write is just um, uh, for public consumption anyway. And I'm on Twitter at Alan Orloff. And I'm on Instagram, although I'm not as active on Instagram. I, I'm, I don't take a lot of photos. Sometimes I do. I always forget to put them on Instagram. So those are probably the places I'm online the most. 
Yeah. I'm going to be doing um, a virtual noir at the bar. And that's, if you're not familiar with that, that's a bunch of crime fiction writers will be leading. And usually we do it at a local bar. Um, but with uh, the social distancing and the bars aren't even open, we're doing it virtually. So it's sort of like, um, I think it's on Crowdcast as the platform. And this one is on May 8th, I believe. I'll be promoting it on my Facebook page. Um, and then we're also, I'm also doing a, on April 26th, a, a virtual thriller, how to write a thriller, um, three, three authors that have stories in The Beat of Black Wings, which is the Joni Mitchell anthology I was speaking of, are each going to give 10 minutes tips on how to write um, thrillers. And that's on April 26th. And again, I think it's going to be on Zoom. You'll have to go to my uh, Facebook page to uh, get the details on that. So I think that's what I've got planned. Um, I'm trying to think if there's something else. I think that's it for now. Yeah. Uh, well, I did look, and it is Alan S. Orloff uh, for okay, Facebook. Thank so. you. Thank you. But uh, yeah. it came up either way when I typed in your name. So. Okay. Uh, yeah. You are not okay. you're not hard to find. Alan, yeah, we have talked. Alan Orloff, uh, I think. Oh, go ahead. Uh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. No, uh, I was just to say we've talked about a lot of different topics, but is there anything that we haven't covered that you wanted to mention in terms of the new book? I know where you sleep, or writing in general. Um, you know, it's also a pleasure for me to work with uh, the great folks at Down and Out Books, which is the pub the publisher of. I know where you sleep. They're, a, um, they're not one of the super large guys, but they do a lot of really excellent crime fiction. Uh, they do a lot of noir stuff, a lot of detective books. They do a lot of these anthologies. Um, and so if, if that's your thing, visit their website. They've got some great deals going on. Uh, and they, they, they ran a COVID-19 sale where they had a, just, I don't know, 30 books or something for a uh, buck 99 or 2.99 or some things in there. Um, and I'd say support your local independent bookstores. Uh, again, with um, them being physically shut down, uh, some of them are going to kind of have some struggling to to survive. So if you want to help support them, go on, go online and um, order books, and I'm sure they'll be happy to ship them out. Absolutely, yes. Um, and you can help them out in that way because most of them are still doing online online orders. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for taking the time to speak to me. Um, I really enjoyed it, and I appreciate you talking to me about your new book, I Know Where You Sleep. Well, Sarah, thanks so much for having me. It's been a lot of fun, and um, I will see you online, I hope. Uh, yes, thank you. Thank you again to Alan for taking the time to speak with me. Thank you, as always, to you, my listeners. I so very much appreciate you and would love to hear from you. Feel free to hit me up on social media and give me your thoughts on the podcast, the interviews, the books, etc. Uh, what are you reading, especially now in isolation? What have you been reading? I would love to hear from you. So uh, go ahead and check out GSMC Book Review, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and let me know how you're doing. I do have copies of this book to give away, so keep an eye on those social media uh, pages to find out how you can win a copy of I Know Where You Sleep by Alan Orloff. If you are a fan of suspense, you will definitely want to check this one out. I know I've said thank you a bunch of times, but really, uh, gratitude. I just feel grateful for the authors that I speak to and uh, you, my listeners. So once again, thank you. If you are a fan of this podcast, please do uh, give us a nice review, whether that's written or five star. We would so appreciate it. Follow us on social media, you know, do all those wonderful things like retweeting and sharing and um all those great social media thing things you know social technical terms social media things uh, that <laughs> help our podcast get out to more listeners and readers like yourselves hope you're having a great week i will be back on friday with another interview this one uh, a dear friend of mine who has written a children's book with a dear friend of hers and that is called morris somewhere out there so please join me as i interview penny waldy about that book have a great week 
Hope you're staying safe, staying well, staying sane, whatever it takes. Um, and uh, I hope you have, well, uh, I'm pretty sure unless you're an essential worker, you do have plenty of time. But I hope you're taking the time to get lost in a good book. Thank you. You've been listening to the Golden State Media Concepts Book Review Podcast. Part of the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network. You can find this show and others like it at www.gsmcpodcast.com. Download our podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, and Google Play. Just type in GSMC to find all the shows from the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network. From movies to music, from sports to entertainment, and even weird news. You can also follow us on Twitter and on Facebook. Thank you, and we hope you have enjoyed today's program.